So the first person I'm going to talk to is Bridie Walker from FRV. Bridie, would you like to come up? So we're just going to have a conversation here. We're going to see how long I can stand on these heels, whether or not I need to duck down and get some back shoes. Um, so the whole idea of this is that I'm not going to introduce Bridie. I'm going to let Bridie introduce herself. So I'm going to start um, by telling, by asking Bridie a little bit about what inspired you to be a firefighter. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, do you want me to introduce myself before I answer that? Uh, we'll get to it. Yes. <laughs> so, unfortunately, I don't have um, a super inspirational story for that. I didn't grow up wanting to be a firefighter because I guess I didn't know that that was a possibility for me. Um, why I wanted to be a firefighter was I had spent the previous 10 or 12 years before working for myself. So what, what made me want to be a firefighter was really the career stability. Um, the promotional opportunities, and then the fact that it was a physical job. Okay, great. Yeah. So, um, how long have you been a firefighter? Uh, so I've just gone over nine years. And so you came into it as a mature. Yeah. So, so what? what Mature-ish. <laughs> I was thirty when uh, when I finished with grades. Yeah. Uh, which isn't. Which isn't particularly old for a recruit. It's not particularly young. We have a wide range that go through. Uh, but previous to that, I worked in hospitality, okay. which is a lovely gateway to lots of careers, um, and also as a personal trainer. Oh, okay. Yeah. And how many women are there? How many women firefighters are there in FRB? We have 167 at the moment. Out of how many? Um, so our percentage is 4.7. So I'm not sure exactly of the total number we have. Trudy, do you know the total number? Over 3,000. Wow. wow, okay. Okay, so it's not huge, not huge. No. How do you think we could inspire more girls to take on roles like that? It's interesting, we were just chatting about this. I was chatting about it with one of the other ladies from work there. Um, language is a massive one with, that we've been working on for a number of years. We really need to call ourselves firefighters, because we are firefighters, we need to scrap the fireman language, that doesn't help. Um, and it doesn't help our little, our little girls know that they can grow up to be firefighters. Um, another thing I think is breaking down some of the misconceptions that people have about firefighters. Uh, people pregnant often, ones. You can be pregnant. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> yes. Uh, and also it's, um, people think uh, we're super brave or we're some other, yeah, not, you know, beyond the normal level or something and we're not we're just really well trained we have really good gear we work in teams and that gives us confidence yeah um yeah people might think we are dragging people out of burning buildings all day but that's a really small part of our job mm. so yeah there's a lot more to firefighting yeah. and we need to really promote that and educate people so they know yeah that's a career did yeah. you see the clip at the start of the day of gianna from up at Wangaratta and she said one of the most inspiring um, times as being a firefighter was when some man stopped the truck in um, Sydney Road and said, can I take your photo? I want to show my daughter girls can do anything. <laughs> yep. And she says that on the little video and it was just so fantastic. So how did you feel when you first went to station? I'm pretty excited. Yeah? Yeah, uh, it's a very exciting time when you get to yeah, leave the training college and you go out to to the station and you get your first job, that's really exciting. Um, and I was really well welcomed. I was the first uh, female firefighter to go to my station, uh, to be appointed to that station. Uh, so I think the rest of the crew was really, um, you know, they were like, what's she gonna be like? What's it gonna be like to have a female around here? I'm gonna have to start cleaning the female toilets now too. <laughs> so it's like all those sorts of things. Um, but they were really great. And um, my first boss from that station is still, a mentor of mine today, of professionally, but he's also one of my really close friends. So that's fantastic. Yeah, I think that goes to show. So tell me, what are you doing now? You're clearly not a firefighter at the moment. Uh, I am still a firefighter. Well, you're still a firefighter, but you're not <laughs> add yeah, on a truck. I'm not on the trucks at yeah. the moment. No, I can't actually fit into my gear. <laughs> um, and, and that actually brings me to the fact that how yeah. thrilled I am to see this outfit. 
It's just amazing. Um, well done, FRV, on that, because when we were up in um, Wangaratta on the weekend, so many of the women in the room were complaining yeah. about what they have to wear. Yeah. And it's yeah. just wokes clothes, basically. Yes, yeah. Although we call it unisex. Yeah, it's great. Yeah. <laughs> but it's, it's not. Yeah, we were discussing that over on the table. We've got a wide range of emergency services over there, and they were like, oh, you've got that, and oh, you've got this. And, it's fabulous. Which, yeah. They thought was really good because they don't have that. No, yeah. it, I think it is fabulous. So what are you doing now? What role yeah, are you doing now? Yeah, so I'm now? off the trucks at the moment. So I'm um, working on a project and I'm the um, Assistant Women's Support Coordinator, which is a new role, a new project that FRV has, has been working on and rolling out. Mm. And yes. what is it? Tell me, what is it? What's the women's support? So um, we, it's almost broken into two parts. We are working on um, attracting and recruiting more women uh, into the operational ranks, supporting them through that, that uh, recruitment process, which is really important, so we can have better levels of success, so we get more women in. And then the other side of it is supporting the women that are already in FRV. Yeah. And um, why was it introduced? Why was the role introduced? Um, the government... Initially, the government did set some aspirational targets for us, some aspirational goals, uh, in terms of the gender balance... Um, so they'd like to see is obviously getting over that 5% and then beyond. Mm. Uh, and also FRV wants to see that as well. Um, and then there was also this other bunch of uh, informal work that was going on where women had created sort of informal networks to support each other um, and that sort of stuff. And so it was making, it was making that formal and putting resources behind that and supporting that work to be done. So has it made a difference? Uh, yes. We've only been going, we've gone just over a year. Uh, we had a lot of hiccups, obviously, with COVID in our yeah. recruitment, got paused. So it's quite hard for us to really um, like analyse the data against previous years. But that said, we still saw an increase in the percentage of women that ended up on recruits this year. Uh, we saw an increase of women getting through our physical stages, just with some extra support there. Um, so that's been really good and... We've also started some forums where all our operational, operational women can hop on. They can put their concerns forward to the executive leadership team um, and we can get information to them. So, Okay. Yeah. So what's, what are you hoping to achieve with the network, say, in the next 12 months? Uh, we'd like to see us just keep working on increasing the numbers of women coming in and then supporting the ones in that are already in through... We've just modernised our pregnancy policy, which is really exciting for us. We've got a, we're working on the breastfeeding policy, which is nearly through, and then we want to start looking at a menopause policy uh, to support our females as well, which is something that's been overlooked <laughs> for a long time. Um, so if we can keep looking at those those policy, making them really robust, um, and whenever little barrier, like if we notice barriers that are there, we can work on those, break them down. And hopefully we see more women promote as well. And what about, like, when you're coming back to work, yeah. what sort of flexibility do you hope for? Uh, so personally for myself, uh, this is my second um, baby that I'll have in the fire service. OK. So hopefully I'll do the same as last time. Um, and, and it should be fine. I, came, I chose to come back to work uh, full time. I wanted to do that. Um, and this time, if there was to be any flexibility required, it would probably be my partner, who's also a firefighter. Okay. Funny would, about that. <laughs> yeah. I, uh, we would look at him working flexibly. Um, so we do have access to flexible work arrangements, which is really good. And we're doing an education piece at the moment around that um, on, you know, that they're available and how managers okay. can help support people go through that process too. Oh, thanks, Bridie. Yeah. Has anybody got a question for Bridie? Yes, Ooh. hand up very fast. <laughs> how can I be a firefighter? <laughs> I'll do the same thing everyone else has done with microphones. It's definitely on. Um, <laughs> Hello, Bryony. How are you going? Hi, I'm good. Um, my good. name's Ree McQueen. I'm from Victoria Police. I happen to be their only product developer heading up the Uniform Design and Development Unit. So I'm very interested in what you're wearing. <laughs> <laughs> Just a bit of FYI for everyone. Victoria Police isn't quite at this stage yet, but it's definitely something that I would like to work towards. Um, you've just said that this is your second baby. Did you have this uniform prior to this? Uh, yes, yeah, so I, I come from um, CFA. So I was a professional firefighter with CFA. So we did have a, um, a maternity uniform. 
it wasn't, the shirt wasn't quite as good, um, the pants were somewhat similar, but um, so we did have that at, at CFA and I'm not sure how long they would, like the CFA would have had the maternity uniform, but, but it has been a fairly long time, at least eight years. I, I, I say yes just because every yeah. person in this room currently wearing a uniform I've probably had a hand in, so I'm really sorry. <laughs> um, line up at the door for complaints afterwards. So thank yeah. you very much. But we're looking at, um, you know, we're not, we're not quite happy with the, the cut of this uniform, so we're, we're working on making it a little better. Um, some women want an option, they, like my pants come up, to hear the sort of over the belly style. Um, some women want an option to be able to tuck their shirt in, so that's been supported and we're coming up with a second pair of pants, like if you'd prefer that. So yeah, that we're getting quite well supported in the uniform and they, the leadership understands that it's, it makes us feel still part of the team. Mm. We're still valued, I still look like a firefighter. I feel like a firefighter, so it's, it's really important. I will definitely come and tap into you later on. <laughs> yeah, there's probably some very interesting stuff there, so yeah, thank you. Friday, thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> Faye Bendrups, come on down. Now, Faye, I know very well, so <laughs> you're at a disadvantage. <laughs> So, where the bodies are buried. Yeah. So, um, Faye is with the SES, obviously, and the SES Volunteer Association. So, she's a very accomplished woman who never ceases to amaze me. Faye's been there, done it. How did you get to be an SES volunteer? Well, it started out in 1998. Um, and that was a, a, a dreadful year for disaster in Australia, which was the year that the Sydney to Hobart yacht race met really bad weather and there were terribly tragic deaths in that year. And boats were lost, people died and over 50 people were rescued. And I'm sitting at home watching, as we do on the, on the telly, a lot of the activity when we see our emergency services go out there and do all our fantastic rescue work. And there was a lot of helicopter rescues out at sea. And I was, at that point, um, the owner-operator of the Australian National Parachute School. And I'd done a lot of all kinds of work and mountaineering, all sorts of things. I was good with ropes. And I thought, well, that sort of rescue work would suit me. I know how to do all that stuff already. Um, and I can rappel out of helicopters if I need to. So, gee, where do I do that, I wonder? And you see all the uniforms, you know, on the telly with all the people doing all the rescue work and you don't quite know what they all are and what they all do, so I thought, oh, that's SES there. I'll go and join the SES. Um, so it took me a little while because SES is hard to find. They're hidden away, you know, they're usually co-located with council operation centres or somewhere down a back alley in an old sort of tin shed. <laughs> they're under-resourced, you know, it's very, very difficult. And that time there wasn't a really terrific website that they had. So it took me a little while to find them. And then, of course, when I did find them and when I did join, I realised they weren't doing helicopter rescues in Bass Strait and all those sorts of <laughs> things. So, um, but nevertheless, um, I sort of thought, well, it would be a good thing to do and to put back into the community. So yes. I'll stay there, I'll see what happens. I'll just sort of put my, my toes in the water and see what comes of that. Well, it took, I think, a really, really short time before people were saying to me, Faye, with you know, you've got all this other experience too. What about taking on a bit of a leadership position? And I'm, oh, I don't have the experience. I've only been here a minute. I don't really know. But it, they press gang me into it and, no, and everyone else stepped back. So, you know, suddenly I was the unit controller, you know, which is like the brigade captain. It's the boss of the unit. Um, and there was no training and there was no sort of advice and no real mentoring, but you just had to work it out on your own what to do. Or look back on some great experience from people in the past at that time too. And I joined up and I I'm, was a controller of Footscray unit. Footscray unit was and always has been a really diverse unit. And in fact, they were the first unit in civil defence days to train up women firefighters, way before MFB did it. They trained three women firefighters in 1971 who topped the class and beat all the men in the course. And, uh, and they did it long before women were uh, allowed into the MFB. 
And it's been, of course, demographically, it's a culturally diverse community, it always has been. So it's always had this great kind of tradition of inclusiveness, diversity, and sort of no questions asked. It's like, well, that's just the community, here we are, that's who joins. So that was terrific. Um, and I suppose as the controller, um, suddenly I found myself in the position of managing, you know, what was at the start a very small unit and it grew very quickly without necessarily having the structural kind of training and everything else that goes with it to know what to do. So what did you do? What did you do that was different? What, what, um, what, yeah, what did you do that was different for that team? So I think I realised that SES, like a lot of the emergency services, are really derived from a very militaristic, hierarchical model, chain of command, and we understand all of that. The PIPs. The PIPs, <laughs> yes, which, like Andrew, I don't know what they mean either. <laughs> so, um, and I thought, well, actually, it's about the people because it's all very well to have all the resources and trucks and everything else, but someone has to drive them. So it actually is about the people. And coming from, I suppose, a background where... At you know, at my age, um, and I was just chatting with my colleagues on the table here from FigPol about I've been involved in different kinds of things in my professional career since the 1970s, including the women's movement. And so to be here still um, and still being involved, A, that's great um, and I want to be involved, but B, I'm a little bit kind of depressed that it's still taking so long. Mm. So what I thought I would do differently is make sure that there was... Um, equal representation across the unit in leadership and in membership of women, men or people from non-binary backgrounds or people from wherever and that there would be diversity of ethnicity, cultural background, um, whatever it was, that we would be have a very diverse unit, very inclusive and it would look like the community it serves. Not be something different, not be, you know, a, a sort of group of white middle-aged men you know, in a certain kind of age and physical range, but it would look like the community that it serves. So um, during the time that I was there as controller, we had basically 50%, 50-50 male-female membership. We had 50-50 um, leadership. We had about 50-50 crews makeup. So each one of our crews was also about 50-50 women and men. And in all the tasks and all the capabilities that, and skills that we trained for, there were no barriers to who got picked to do what roles. So when people came in, it was, um, here we are in this unit and anyone does anything in this unit and all roles are equal. And that includes whether it be the more kind of hands-on operational roles like chainsawing up trees and swaths, getting up on roof, rooftop safety systems, or whether it be engaging with the community and doing school visits, whatever it might be, all the tasks are the same. So we get requests for assistance, and that assistance might be for an operational response, but it also might be to educate the community. So I wanted all of the members in my unit to be able to do all of those tasks and to enjoy those tasks, and not to have what is sometimes still common, which is that men get to do all the really hard stuff like chainsaw, and the women will do the support roles like administration, sort of secretarial tasks, welfare, community education, where they're, you know, they can talk to people because the mm. men can't. Mm. So we sort of eliminated that. It just sort of disappeared because that wasn't going to be that way. Yeah. Um, and it was great because it meant that all of our operational crews were also out doing community, community education. They were also out there educating, engaging with community at all times. And it wasn't gendered where the men got to do getting up on the roofs and the women got to do making the cup of tea. OK, we've, we've got to be a bit... Um, I've got a couple more questions. Um, you're currently the president of the National SES Volunteer Association. What influence have you taken to that from a women's, woman's perspective? Well, I'm president of the Victoria, oh, Victoria. SES Volunteers Association and vice chair of the National SES Volunteers yep. Association. So I suppose at the Victorian level, at the state level, um, the big concern we have at the moment is, unsurprisingly, things to do with sexual harassment and bullying and all those sorts of things about culture that happen in units. And with all the other things that have been going on out there in the community, there's been a sudden upsurge as well of people in SES who are coming forward with stories that have not been told before. 
and our main concern then, of course, is for the welfare of our volunteers and bringing those stories out into the light. So, so what, what would be the most enduring learning experience you've had during your time as a volunteer? I suppose apart from the things to do with representing and advocating for the volunteers, which is where I've been for the last few years, as well as still remaining a volunteer, the other thing, Susan, which was really critical for me, was the Emergency Services Foundation Scholarship, okay. which I was awarded in 2014. And that was before Susan's time in ESF. And it was the most amazing opportunity where I went to do a study in Peru on earthquake and tsunami response. And they have more than 400 earthquakes a year over there. And the, what they do is they have whole of nation emergency exercises and drills. And four times a year, they have whole of nation drills and an extra four that are done throughout all the school population. So the kids do eight a year and the rest of the population do four wow. a year. The whole of community is involved. And in terms of community engagement, there's this enormous buy-in for the community to take responsibility for their safety and also to learn about emergencies and to be able to respond in disasters. And it was just the most amazing experience. I was attached to the National Institute of Civil Defence. I was there for the exercise. I was really um, hosted by the, the head of the National Institute. And I was also sent up to remote Andean regions um, in the Machu Picchu National Park to work with the local park rangers up there on bush firefighting techniques. Because apart from SES, I also, in the summer season, I'm out as a base camp manager with DELP and, the, and firefighters. So I've got a lot, bit of experience in fire as well. So I had this amazing, amazing experience which I brought back with me and which fed into all the things that we tried to implement for community engagement as well. Fantastic. So just quickly, what advice could you share with the young women in the sector? Because, I mean, we are women of a certain age. Yeah. <laughs> so Sadly. Please, please someone come and replace me. Um, and please get inside the tent. We can't make changes from outside. We have to be in there. And any organisation you join, there's going to be ups and downs. And the emergency services might be a little bit slower than some of the others, but we can't make change if we're sitting on the outside and we need all the younger generations of people coming through to get in there and to make those changes. One of the big things we're doing with the National SES Volunteers Association each year is we sponsor young emerging leaders because we see that it's critical for that next generation coming because they are the ones who are going to make the change. If Susan and I haven't done it so far, well, you know, we've got to have everyone else come in. <laughs> Thank you, <laughs> Thank Faye. You. Thank you. When I grow up, I want to be like Faye. <laughs> Thank you, Faye. Um, what an inspiration. Nicole McGrath from CF CFA. I haven't said hello yet, Nicole. I haven't. Oh, I know. I Sorry. Can you tell my feet are starting to kill me? I'm sort of wriggling. Take them off. Yeah, I will in a minute. <laughs> <laughs> so, Nicole, tell us a little bit about you. Yeah. Where um, are you from? So, I'm. Is this on? Yes, it yeah. is. I can hear it now. Yeah. We'll do that. Isn't it yeah. great? Um, so, I'm a volunteer firefighter from Ballarat. Ballarat City is my station. Uh, I joined CFA in 1998, in March, um, through a period of pretty significant upheaval mm. following um, the Linton okay, fires. Yeah. And uh, having grown up in Geelong West, okay. and being my own community, I actually almost left CFA uh, at that time. Um, but I rallied and I stuck around and now they can't get rid of me. Mm -hmm. um, I've been hanging around for a while now. So I've um, been at Ballarat City the entire uh, 23 years now, and held various positions there. I was the first chair of a class five brigade back in 2001. Uh, been a brigade officer, and now I hold the position of captain. Oh, uh, well City. done. How many women captains are there in CFA now? Do you know? Uh, not enough. N no. Not, no, not enough. No. Um, I can't. I don't have the exact figures, but no. I do know in my district, I'm one of four. Okay. And uh, 18 months ago, there was only two of us. So. Changing. Changing. Um, and I know down to long way they've just elected a couple as well. Okay. So uh, what percentage of the total volunteers are women? Yeah, well, thank you, Jess. I'm going to thank you now um, <laughs> for getting me these figures. Um, I, I, I wasn't really quite aware of where we actually sat. So I've got the figures here. 
So of a total of 54,400 members, we have 12,600 women. Okay. Only 4,300 are operational. Okay, interesting. And I think the other thing, if I could just reflect on that for a moment, when we talk about operational positions, the further up the chain we get, the less representation of women there are. And not even just in those positions of captain, deputy group officer and group officer, but also in some of the operational roles. Yeah. So strike team leaders, um, sector commanders, level three incident controllers, staging area managers, we all start to see significant drop off. Drop off. Now this is not a question you were expecting. What yeah. difference do you think that would make if you had those women in those roles, more women in those roles? Huge. Huge, huge difference. So I'm a, I'm a really big advocate for women in leadership positions in CFA. I think it will bring about um, some of the first steps for some of our significant cultural change that needs to occur. I think that um, it certainly brings different ways of operating, um, different thought processes, different skill sets. Um, so for example, if I reflect on my own um, leadership position right now as captain, we all have these ideas around what we think a CFA captain should look like, the, yeah. you know, the go get a strong guy, and my brigade's transitioning through some of the most significant changes in our history through fire services reforms, and the parts of me I thought I had to suppress were actually the things that my brigade wanted. So they wanted someone who could empathise with them, with how they were feeling, who could help them understand their feelings and manage the change and to help guide them through that process of transition. Um, they didn't want someone up there belting orders at them and telling them what to do and um, just um, perhaps saying, well, you just need to get over that, mm -hmm. let's move on. Um, so that's probably the most enlightening thing that's come from my perspective taking on this role. Um, and I hope that what that brings, as more women step into these places, it brings that um, those skill sets into, the, into those roles and helps adjust the culture. So CFA's got the women's networks. We do. Tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, so different regions have different approaches. Some have um, reference groups, um, which is what I'm part of in my district. Others have just networking groups or, or more social mentoring groups. Our um, reference group um, was formed under the um, suggestion of our local assistant chief officer who wanted to increase diversity on district planning committees. So district planning committees are highest level of volunteer representation um, for our area. They report directly to the assistant chief and provide him with information about issues affecting volunteers. There were no women represented on that um, group in Ballarat. And so he wanted to increase representation. So we set up as part of the women's reference group that we would approach DPC and ask for two delegates to be included. And they um, agreed and changed their constitution to allow for two of us to um, attend and have full voting rights at their meetings. And so I'm one of those delegates. And that includes um, discussions on all matters, including operational matters. Yeah. Um, so that's one of our roles. We've done and do you, do, you bring a different, do you feel you bring a different perspective yeah. to that discussion? Yeah, we do. And I think sometimes we underestimate our own contribution. I've been in CFA for 23 years and some of the men in that room have been in CFA for less. Mm. And so I do bring experience to the role mm. that I sometimes underestimate. I sometimes yeah. have a habit of disregarding how long I've been there and just what I've learned. Yeah. 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 So... Um, what do men in leadership need to know about what it's like being a woman in CFA in the sector? The first thing I think is, um, well, one, of, one of the big ones I think we need to be careful we never slip into tokenism. So that whenever we, uh, you know, there's probably nothing more shattering to someone's confidence to think that they're in a position not because of what they bring to it, but because of who they are. And sometimes I feel like in CFA we, throw women into these spots or in front of cameras or, or in front of in, um, media because of what they are, not who they are. So I think we need to really address that and start embracing the skills that women bring to roles and start treating those skills seriously and drop the tokenism part of things um, because it's not just a checkbox exercise of putting women in front. I think um, when Andrew spoke before about listening, I think that's a huge part of it. And I think um, male leaders need to be willing to have some pretty upfront and frank discussions around some of the things that are happening 
and how we can really work to address them instead of hoping they go away. So what you, you've got a new CEO. Yes. Woman. Yes. What's your hope for that? We were actually really, really fortunate. We had an International Women's Day event hosted by our women's reference group. Um, it was statewide and we had that on Sunday and Natalie attended that and she spoke strongly about her views around cultural change, around her views around um, creating a more inclusive space and a more values-driven space. And I'm really hopeful that we can see that through and that we can see some of that change evolve. Okay. Thank, thank you very much, Nicole. <laughs> so I'm now going to ask Monique Hustler from Red Cross to come up, please, Monique. Deep breath. Um, so, where are you from, Monique? Um, I'm originally from La Trobe Valley, uh, Churchill specifically. Um, I was born in Maui, or Maru, for people who've watched too much of The Simpsons. <laughs> um, and then in 2014, I relocated to Warrnambool to pursue a Bachelor's in, of Environmental Science, um, specialising in marine biology. Um, it's been about three years, I think, since I graduated. And um, I've now got a very expensive piece of paper that I'm not currently using. <laughs> but it's okay. Yeah. Because um, I think moving away from home taught me a lot of things. And one of them was that not everything always works out how you hope or how you plan. But that's okay. So t tell us about Red Cross. How did you get involved with Red Cross? Um, I originally got involved in Red Cross in 2019. Um, there was a, I think it was like an emergency services information sort of day at our local TAFE. And I went to see, you know, who I might be able to get involved with. Um, I've always been involved in some sort of volunteer work. Um, Good Friday Appeal Back Home, um, volunteered for whale watches, whale watching, sorry, um, when I moved to uni. And Red Cross just seemed like a good fit, you know, I'd be able to help a lot of different people going through a lot of different things and, you know, that's, that's something that I wanted to do. So, I understand you've had a very traumatic experience. Are you able to tell us about that? Yes. <laughs> it will be slow. <laughs> okay. Come a bit closer over here, yeah? Lean on here if you need. Um, I haven't shared this story with, you know, like a hundred or so of my closest strangers <laughs> <laughs> before. Um, whew, um, on the 2nd of December 2016, I was, I was sexually assaulted on a train on my way to see family in the valley. And um, luckily the man was caught because, you know, he's he was on the train too, it wasn't, you know, he couldn't get away very fast. <laughs> um, so he was caught, he was escorted off the train and he was charged. Um, after what felt like a very, very long drawn out court ordeal, um, he was sentenced to just three months in prison with 68 days time served. Um, a lot of you, might feel upset, annoyed. Um, I was too. Mm. Um, I wasn't his only victim, unfortunately. There were, rough, I think they said roughly four other girls younger than I was at the time. Um, and he got three months for all of us. Wow. So you overcame, you know, stepping onto a train again was going to obviously be a very big thing, wasn't it? It was. Um, for a long time after that, I, I couldn't get on a train. I didn't want to think about trains, um, mostly because they scared me. Um, and the first time I actually got back on a train was the May, I think, May 2017. And it wasn't even for me. It was for my mum, because it was Mother's Day, and there was no way on this earth that I was going to miss Mother's Day. <laughs> yeah. 
So. And did you take a train to Gippsland in a deployment? I did. My very first deployment with Red Cross was New Year's Day 2020. I was sent out to Bansdale. Um, and from there, I sort of bounced around between Lake Centrance, Bansdale, and eventually landed in Sale. Um, but yeah, getting back on that train to um, you know, go towards a fire <laughs> was, um, was an interesting experience because I've, I've been involved in bushfires before. The um, Black Saturday 2009 bushfires around the Hazelwood South and Geralang area. Um, that, that's my neck of the woods and, you know, it was... Oh no, it's hard to describe, like, the 180 turn in circumstance. You know, in just 10 years I've gone from potentially preparing to evacuate because of that fire to now being in a, circ in a position where I'm going towards a fire to help other people who are now feeling what I felt back then. And um, it's going to sound bizarre. And I bet some of you have wondered why I brought the spatula up on stage with me. Um, it was actually this that sort of spurred me on to actually get back on the train. About two weeks after the assault, um, I walked into my kitchen of my share house and I was living with three to four 20-ish year old men at the time. And you know, the thing about men at that age is sometimes they like to make a lot of dishes, they don't like to wash a lot of dishes. <laughs> so I walked in, saw this absolutely massive pile and I was just like, all right, fine. And about five minutes in, I come across this. And I probably couldn't even tell you why now, but for some unknown reason, it just it stopped me dead in my tracks. And then it was just this overwhelming feeling of just like, I am, <laughs> it sounds really weird saying it out loud, but I am this spatula. You know, I'm, I'm dirty. I'm unwanted, yeah. you know, no one's ever... <laughs> You're certainly not that. <laughs> you certainly are that. not that. I know that now, but um, at the time it was like, you know, no one's ever going to want to touch you or be near you again because you're exactly like this. It's an animate piece of plastic and it just shut me down. <laughs> So after a couple of minutes of you know, having a bit of a panic attack, I sort of crumpled to my kitchen floor and then two of my housemates came in, we'll call them Bill and Ben, because I don't know if they want to be known, um, and they just they bundled around me and they just kept telling me that it was okay, it was all right, you know, everything's going to be fine. Like They had no idea what was going on. <laughs> they might have had an idea, but I don't think they knew it was a spatula that set me off. <laughs> And um, deployment eve of that first deployment, I was just, I was pacing around my house. I'm like, you know, I don't know if I'm going to be able to do this. Like, this is such a huge responsibility. Like, you know, how am I meant to take care of all these other people when sometimes I don't even take care of myself? <laughs> and then I saw this just sitting on the bench. And I was like, you know what? I can do it. And I'm going to do it. Because... I want to challenge myself. I want to choose to be more than how this spatula ever made me feel, ever. And that's why I did it. I got back on that train because I wanted to prove to myself that I could be more because I know I'm more. And... and And I know just how hard this has been for you, but I also know that telling that story is going to be a turning point for you. And, uh, you know, you've shown how brave you are going forward and getting on that train and going to that deployment, and, and that was one step in your journey. And today, I hope, has been another step in your journey. 
and you can see all these people around you who are, you know, strangers this morning but have great empathy for you and we're all collectively so proud of you and you epitomise choosing to challenge. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mary. You all right? You OK? Yeah, sure. I think the only thing I want to leave you all with today, men, women, non-binary, all sorts, choose to challenge yourself. Be more than your spatula. <laughs> because if you don't choose to challenge it, you don't know what you're going to miss out on because of it. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. What, how incredibly brave. Hannah from Life Saving. Hannah Samokas. Hannah is the person who Andrew was talking about, who was leading us through this scenario down at Life Saving Victoria the other day. Um, so welcome. You didn't know that you were going to see me again, did you? <laughs> so, Hannah, before we start, um, tell me a little bit about you. What, what do you do? What's your day job? <laughs> so, I'm a member of Woolamai Beach Surf Life Saving Club, which is in Phillip Island, and I've been a member there for 11 years now. Um, I started off volunteering and then moved into a lifeguard position, and then through that, I guess got to know all the opportunities that come with being a member uh, of Life Saving and worked my way through different avenues and um, yeah, find myself here today. But um, other than that, I'm a student still, um, studying teaching and hope to teach, probably prep. <laughs> so I've got a lot of patience. <laughs> Um, and yeah, I'm on the tail end of that degree now. Fantastic. So um, Hannah was named Life Saver of the Year this year. Wow. <laughs> So, tell us how you got to be Lifesaver of the Year. What is that? <laughs> well, I was actually thinking about this a lot um, last night, and I don't think that it, I guess, there's not really one thing that I've done or achieved that I guess has, yeah, lead, led me to this, but I also think that it's a team victory of the people that have supported me, um, the team that I work with, who I feel are just so incredibly supportive. I think all the females at, um, in my life-saving team feel valued and respected. I think the culture has changed and it makes me feel valued. And I think that Life Saving Victoria as a whole are an organisation that have supported both males and females, which has now led me to have the confidence to achieve my goals and, I guess, yeah, become. So how do you actually get named? What is, it, is there a voting process or a nomination process? How does that yeah, work? Yeah, so there's a nomination process and then you uh, do a series of interviews and then one person's chosen, yeah. Okay, fantastic. Um, I'm wearing this little thing on my wrist here. Pink <laughs> Patrol. Tell us about Pink Patrol, Life Saving Victoria Pink Patrol. What is it? You've got your pink pants on. I do. <laughs> <laughs> so the Pink Patrol is an all-female-led patrol day. So we run the beach. We have all females who are leading the operation. We have um, the patrol captains and team managers, all females, and um, all rescues and duties throughout the day are carried out by females. So why did LSV start that? So it initially actually started at different club levels. So clubs wanted to celebrate the females that are at their club and I guess showcase all the amazing talents that we have. And then Life Saving Victoria recognised that it was very much so in line with what they wanted to do and what they wanted to achieve and I guess turned it into something greater. And now we have, I think, over 25 different clubs across the state who do this all together for a weekend um, each year. OK, that was my next question. How many <laughs> clubs involved? So 25 clubs. How many clubs all together? Do you know? Oh, that's a good question. A lot. Um, I'm not sure exactly yeah, how many, okay. but when we are... Um, the initiative is growing, which is amazing. And every year there are more clubs um, and 
more people are hearing about it and yeah, I think that's what's really important. And yesterday I saw on LinkedIn that Life Saving Victoria has trained a group of women from Iran. Do you, yeah. do you know anything about that? It's, yeah, they have so many different projects that they're working on and a lot of them are to empower females. Um, they've done some in Sri Lanka and now Iran. And yeah, it's just amazing to give everybody an equal opportunity at um, success and empowerment really. And it really comes out of the fact that, you know, a lot of these people who come to Australia as refugees can't swim, mm. you know, and they drown when they go to the beach. So Life Saving's got this fantastic strategy of helping them learn to do that, but then take it, taking it a step further. Mm. I was blown away when I saw that last night. So what about the Pink Patrol? What difference has that made to people like you? I think that, so when I first started, um, I was 12, and they had these inspirational speakers that came and talked to us about pathways and what you can achieve and opportunities. And I thought they were all so inspiring, but when I walked away, I was thinking, well, every single one of them were a male. So how can I have a realistic goal when I don't have any role models that I can follow because I didn't know that anybody else had done it? And I think having a pink patrol and female empowerment groups shows younger females coming up that you can do it and here's a realistic person just like you that's achieved everything that you might want to and here's a network that will support you and help you reach those goals. Are there many older women in life saving? Yeah, and they're honestly so inspiring to hear about some of the challenges that they've had and then compare that to me who I've had so many people that have supported me. Um, yeah, they're really the pioneers for change within life saving. So what do, what's the reaction of the public when they see Pink Patrol? I think that it's, it can definitely be mixed. Um, it is a conversation starter, which is good because I guess the more we talk, the more we learn, and that's what's, I guess, the most important. Um, I think some people are surprised, and then other people are excited and, yeah, want to get their families involved and grandchildren and things like that, yeah. Well, Life Saving's a bit different to the other services, of course, because it's got nippers and it starts from very young, so you're sort of, you're breeding people all the way through, aren't you? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> So, oh, well, you know what I mean. Um, uh, what, um, so has anybody got a question for Hannah? Inspiring young woman that she is. Up the back, Trudy. Um, it's something that I'm heavily thinking about at the moment. I think when I first started it was a, something to do over the summer and something that I enjoyed, but then as I've moved further into the organisation and I guess tried out lots of different things, I'm realising that it's definitely a lot more than just a little hobby on the side. So my goal is to try everything, take on every opportunity, and I heard someone earlier say to never say no. So I guess that's my goal for the future is to take on all opportunities and see where that, I guess, puts me within the organisation. It's interesting because up in Wangaratta on the weekend, I definitely heard a couple of uh, young women there who were volunteers say, you know, I'm a volunteer but I've come here today and now I'm thinking this might be a career for me, you know, in, in different fields. So that was um, fantastic. Thank you, Hannah. Thank, Thank you. you for sharing your story. Now, Kath Gosby. Kath was one of the people in the video that I showed at the start of the day. How are you? That's a big step. That is a big Good, step. Thank you. <laughs> Tell us a little bit about you, Kath. Where are you from, for a start? Uh, so I'm currently based at Horsham, but I have worked all around the state with DELP and it's very many named departments because we do change our name a lot. <laughs> Hence, we now have FFM Vic. So yeah, okay. everyone knows who we are now. So you're a level three incident controller. Not everybody in the room is going to know what that means. Right. Tell, let, tell, tell them. Um, 
So I think most of it is around the firework. You'll see the aim structure. So you'll see people with tabards. I actually started before. We had beautiful tabards. So you'll have an incident controller, you have a planning officer, an operations officer, and a logistics officer, and they all get together. And we, we help to put the fires out all together as a team. But, but there's that structure, and it probably comes from the military as well in the sense of how we set, set those processes up. Yeah, but level three. Level three. Um, of course, once we had a structure, then you had to have hierarchy in it because that's what we do. <laughs> yes. Um, and you start at a level one and you move your way up to a level two or a level three. So in terms of any level three, so planning officer, operations officer, logistics or incident controller, you actually have to sit a panel. So you get to your level two and then you have to put a, a body of evidence to get work body of work together for your evidence and that's probably no H&S risk because it's so big and it's so heavy. <laughs> you take to the panel, um, you have to submit it, they check it, then you have to go and sit an interview, you have to do a psychometric test, always fun to find out what your furballs are. Um, and probably furballs in my case, I've got a husky. <laughs> and um, so you go through that process. Now there was one other lady who sat the panel at the same time I did. She hasn't quite got her accreditation yet, so hopefully we'll have two level three incident controllers who are female because I'm the first one. You're the first one. To success. Yeah. <laughs> and you know, a basic question, how hard was that? Well, I started in 88. Let's put it and that when, way. And when did you get to level three? Last year. Wow. <laughs> persistence. Um, yeah, persistence. That is a bit, bit, bit about me. Um, I luckily started working in forestry. So my first 10, 12 years was working in forestry. So I got to know what big bits of equipment did. I got to tell lots of men what to do who used the big bits of equipment. <laughs> I got to put in road lines, I got to do lots of that work and you had to do fire as part of your role. So whether you liked it or not, you got to do fire. Luckily, as I said, it was before a lot of the structure came in. So I think I'd been working two years and someone gave me a phone and said, you're the duty officer. And I went, well, what's that? And they went, you'll work it out. And that's how we did things. So it, I, I think I was lucky that I could get my accreditations and my experience before the structures come in because I was speaking to some girls here today that I think the structures are actually working against us and we're actually going a bit backwards at the why, moment. Why, why do you say that? Because people put so many steps in and you've got to go and do a certain course to do that rather than just going on your experience and your ability to do that. And so... Um, I think it's reducing, it, it's definitely extending how long it takes for people to get up through the levels. And what, you mean longer than since 1988? Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> um, no, we've got a few coming up and it's great. Um, in operations, that is still a real problem for us is to get more women in the operations and that's literally going and put the wet stuff on the red stuff type operations. Um, luckily, I did have accreditation in that as well, so I think all of that helped with my getting my final accreditation. So, why did you want to do it? Why did you want to be level three? I'm a reluctant. No, <laughs> um, I in in our system, you can be a level two incident controller, and you could end up with a level three fire because that's just the luck of the draw. So, it depends where the fire comes. I had done it on many occasions without having the accreditation. I would always stand up and go, yeah, sure, I'll do that, whatever. Um, and so, and then you just do it. Uh, so I, was, I knew I could do it. I've done nearly every, I have done every major fire we've had in this state for probably nearly the start of each fire to the end of each fire. I've been there doing different roles. Um, I've also done uh, a bit of fire work in WA when I worked over there for a little period of time. Um, I had a lovely boss who was going to come today but couldn't make it, which is Rachel May, and she was our assistant chief fire officer when I started on this path and we were discussing how we don't have any female level three incident controllers and she said, well, you're probably the only one who's going to get there in the next five years. We didn't know about um, Steph at that time and I went, oh, all right, I'll go away and think about it because I knew what reactions some people would have to having a level three incident controller being a female. 
And I had what, a lot What reactions would they be? Not particularly positive. What makes you say that? Um, that is from my experience from 20 years. Like, even when you're filling the role, you, you get a lot of uh, pushback or people who enjoy standing over the top of you and yelling at you. Again, my experience in forestry helped a lot with those sort of processes. Um, after Rachel had asked me to do it, I had a weekend with my niece, Hannah, who was going to private girls' school, and I was discussing it with her, and she gave me a good lecture about how women won't stand up and women won't do this, and then I went, well, what choice do I have? <laughs> so, so you were inspired by a young woman? Yes. Well, two. Two. Well, most in our organisation are younger than me. Yeah. <laughs> but a very young one. So, was apart from Rachel, who was your boss, yep. um, was there anyone else who supported you along the way? Oh, look, there's been many women that I've worked with, worked for, who have all, um, I suppose, led on this path in different ways. I was involved in a lady who was trying to organise us to have a uniform that was a two piece. If anyone was around long enough for that discussion, um, that went on for three years and it was unsafe to have two-piece uniforms. And explain... I, I'm assuming everybody understands <laughs> why that's... Not everybody understands why that's an issue. All right, so when I started, you had a one-piece uniform and you had to wear pants underneath and everything, and if you need to go to the toilet out you the had bush... To, you were yeah. basically naked. Well, and it was a half-an-hour process as well because you just had to find a bush and do all that sort of stuff. So we were, I think CFA had had two piece for quite a while before we did. Um, so we started this process and one of the ladies that was really pushing it worked for me and I helped her support her through that. But um, So we went through it and we were told all the safety reasons why you could not have a two piece uniform because it was unsafe and there'd be fire issues and blah, 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 blah. Interestingly enough, once we got it approved, Everyone had two piece within two years, and some of the biggest people who said no, you can't have it, got the first ones. <laughs> Interesting. So, what advice would you give your younger self? What advice I'd give my younger self is to say yes, as we've been discussed, because I always would say yes and then go, oh my god, why did you agree to do that? Um, to trust your intuition, because often that is the right thing to do. Like. Mm. Whatever comes as your gut intuition to do, then that's probably the right thing to do. And now, now that I'm a bit more older and wiser, I would teach myself around things like gaslighting and manipulation and bullying so that you can recognise it when it's happening to you instead of getting dragged down that rabbit hole and then going... What do you mean by gaslighting? Uh, so gaslighting, and I can't explain it as well as what all the TED Talks can, but it's a very subtle form of undermining you and taking your power away. And it can be really, really subtle, and it can go on for a long time. Um, and recently I was talking to a lady around it, and she watched some TED Talks, and then she came back to me and went, oh, my God, that's been happening to me for the last three years. Like, and it was... I suppose that was a good thing to learn and it wasn't even a term when I started. So my, I think knowledge is power. And so I think for some of the people coming into the, all these organisations, if you understand those behaviours and how they work and how they work on you, then it makes it easier to stand up to them. Okay. Thank you very much, Kat. Thank you.